Thank you for the honour, Janie, of being invited to chair this final session. I feel hopelessly inadequate to the task, given the strength of this panel, but I'll, I will do my best. Uh, uh, there's something, a, a great curse uh, about being a Vice-Chancellor. All of these wonderful things happen on campus, all over the campus, all the time. Uh, and you either get to swan in at the end, as today, uh, and desperately try and sum up, or worse, you get to open really interesting things and leave before anything interesting is said. Um, <laughs> in either case, it's, it's really dis disturbing. Um, I'd like to add my welcome to this sort of wonderful, distinguished group of people interested in art and philanthropy, which are two topics close to everybody's heart. Uh, I'm particularly delighted that Janie and Kerry have um, brought this program together and I congratulate them on the leadership that, that's made this possible. You've grappled today with some really important issues and I'm hoping we'll get echoes of that in this panel session, a little chance to hear how some of that. And of course, all Australian institutions are really anxious to learn from the rest of the world and to think about our role in the Asia and the Pacific and how we're going to bring those lessons together. Uh, we've got a very long commitment here at the University of Melbourne to both the study and practice of art. Um, Joni Anderson, a uh, hugely distinguished Herald Chair of Fine Arts, a, a role she's going to stand down from. Uh, I only found out when I read my notes, uh, which I was disappointed to hear, but to concentrate on her role as Director of the Australian Institute of Art History, which is great. And Joni, you've been a really, and will continue to be a really important part of this institution. And it's, Can people hear? Okay, they're nodding. That's right. I think it's broadcast. Um, uh, can I uh, acknowledge the supporters of today's symposium, the Australian Government's Creative Partnerships Agency, uh, a number of board members of the of the institute. Uh, I saw Sir Andrew there. Sir Andrew, g'day. Uh, Fred as well, Fred Grimwade, uh, Fraser Hopkins, Sarah Morgan, Hugh Morgan and the Helen McPherson Smith Trust. All of your support is greatly appreciated. Uh, and I'm just delighted to, to know there are people from around the country and indeed the region who have, who have a shared interest in this. Uh, come to any university uh, or any large institution, as you just heard Jean talking about, uh, and there are extraordinary collections all through this country. I, I walked through the old arts building to get to this building, and at the moment we have on the wall all of these uh, 19th century reproductions of William Blake's work, which are just extraordinary, and there they are up for, for students to walk by. And we might take them for granted, but every time a new generation of students arrives on campus, they see all of this miraculous material. And we uh, on the faculty here are all coming to terms with the fact that the students who will arrive next week were generally born in 1996. Uh, and so <laughs> <laughs> this is very new for them. <laughs> However extraordinary we find it. Uh, and this institution, like so many, has benefited from philanthropy for 160 years. Uh, we are in the Kenneth Meyer building. We are, in fact, in the unusual situation of having on the western uh, edge of our precinct the Kenneth Meyer building and on the eastern precinct the Sydney Meyer building. Two generations of a family uh, recognised individually for the support they gave to this institution. So Rupert, it's delighted to welcome a third generation uh, and the Meyer family have been marvellous consistent supporters of this institution since 1920. So that's the sort of traditions that make philanthropy great. So I've been asked to ask a series of questions in the hope that I can start a conversation, uh, which is what I'll do. And, and Thomas, if, if I may turn to you in your, your role of director of the Getty Research Institute, an extraordinarily important international institute that advances global discussions about art history. I guess the question everybody asks you, and, and what advice do you give to those around the world who seek to think through the contribution of art history and the way that institutions can make a difference? And you are very welcome to come forward. It's like a first year lecture, talking to everyone in the back of the room. <laughs> but, but Thomas, what advice would you give to institutions and universities and others in Australia based on your experience? Well, I, I don't think I have to give any advice. Um, I think uh, that's not my role and it's also not in my character. I think um, I can only talk about my, my personal 
development and my personal experience um, uh, in during the last um, 10 or 20 years in art historical research and um, being part also of processes uh, um, of um, art historical research in um, research institutes. Um, I think that um, my career represents also a huge change and one of the major changes um, was that um, from a very uh, Western oriented art historian I moved into a more a global perspective, and that's what we all do, and that was um, also what um, Janie did here in um, uh, in Melbourne. And um, we all um, moved more um, closely together, and uh, this is, I think, um, uh, a just a wonderful experience, and also a topic for the future. Both. It is a great um, experience to learn that um, there is not only one art history, but there are many art histories in the world. And we have to try to find out how we can inspire each other and how we can learn from each other. In a certain way, um, art history uh, has a founding base in Europe, um, but we are beyond that. And there are, there's a lot of creativity, creativity elsewhere and we have to integrate that into our thinking and, and to the way we are teaching and the way we are experiencing, uh, experiencing that um, ourselves. Thank you. I'm hoping we can return to these themes, but just to bring in the panel. So I turn to you, Rupert. You, part, you published in the last few days a wonderful interview about a letter to your younger self uh, in which you reflected on what... <laughs> What had you wished someone had told you when you were young? Or what had you wished you'd told yourself? You, you advised to ignore that snide remark from the music teacher, to commit poetry and songs to your memory and your heart, and to prepare to encounter an artwork that you'll think about every day of your life. It was a wonderful interview, an extraordinary story. I really hugely enjoyed it. Two questions, I, I guess. A personal one about how do you reflect on the importance of art in a life, in any life, but in your life as well. And in the institutional one, how do we think about, encourage and act on endowments and support for the arts? What's the way we should be thinking about that in contemporary circumstances? Lynn, my goodness, we've, <laughs> we've, we've been at this since nine o'clock. <laughs> well, you know the answers by now. <laughs> let, me, let, let, me, let me go to the, to the second first. Uh, um, and um, I guess it echoes, it echoes some of the remarks, of, um, in, indeed, from all of the speakers this morning about the, um, the model that we enjoy in this country of uh, you know, great government support and great private support. And I think that's reflected in the university uh, as well. It's a, it's a great model and we need to do everything we can to, uh, to maintain it and, uh, and, and honour it, actually. Um, uh, we don't want to give uh, uh, the government any reason to think that uh, the investment that they make in the sector isn't anything but incredibly worthwhile. Uh, and we want them to do everything that would inspire you know, the next generation of uh, philanthropic uh, support. Um, uh, and uh, indeed, I think that's, um, uh, that's something that we must um, you know, c uh, continue to, uh, to honour. On, on the first of those, I wasn't expecting that. I thought I'd snuck that on an online site and that no one was ever going to ask me about it. So I should know the online world is, uh, is in, everyone's, uh, in everyone's lap. I guess I should have figured that out. Um, um, Look, I, I think, um, you, aren't we all fortunate? We've spent a day here talking about uh, art history, about uh, access to great objects, about uh, sharing the experiences of being in places where we have uh, art experiences. We've been able to go on journeys around the region. We've talked about individual institutions. We've talked about uh, experiences that we've had in places with, uh, with people who we've enjoyed being with, with objects that we've enjoyed observing. Um, uh, having the sorts of conversations that uh, <clears throat> that we've we've wanted to have with the people that we wanted to have those conversations with, and you know what a what a great opportunity and what a what a great thing for a, you know room to to eavesdrop on some of those conversations and hopefully you know p uh, participate as, as this discussion goes on. Fantastic. Again, I hope we can come back to some of these themes. 
Simon, I've observed the extraordinary leadership and dedication you've committed to the Biennale and to the Australian representation there over several Biennales and, and your commitment to making sure the new pavilion happens and, and is the great success it deserves to be. Can I ask why the Biennale? Why is it worth so much effort and attention? And what does the Biennale give back to a broader audience? Uh, thank you. Um, the Biennale, as we talked about earlier in the day, is the, um, the equivalent of the World Expo in contemporary art, or as Rupert's said once before, the Olympic Games of contemporary art, but without a competitive element. Um, it's an extraordinary event. It's, it is a place where Australia can put up its best visual arts in a global context and where an audience of half a million people will visit over a six month period. So for Australia and for those of us who believe passionately in advocating for Australia, it is, it is the forum internationally and um, I should say the support of the university and, and yours in particular, Glenn, to our initiative there has been um, really fantastic, so thank you. And in terms, thank you, but in terms of it as an education opportunity, not only highlighting Australian art, but teaching ourselves about where it fits in a global context. How does the Benali work there? Well, is, it, is it the impact on artists? I, I think, again, it, it's, it's a place where almost 100 countries are exhibiting. And, and so you can see how we fit in a global context. And for emerging curators and um, students, it's an incredibly important place to um, not only position Australia, but for them to see how other countries' art is emerging in a global, global sense. Thank you. Uh, Fiametta, there's not many journalists who specialise in uh, art in the way that you do and take it to such an extraordinary audience through The Economist and other outlets, and your Christmas special on art uh, is widely read. Again, can I ask your aims in doing this? Why? Why this vehicle? What is it that you want to communicate as a journalist? And what interests you about the interaction that results? I, I became completely riveted about museums, I think, um, in the last two or three years. I grew up in Kenya. I grew up on a farm. I didn't go to a museum until I was 20. And when <laughs> I went, I thought that it was just one of the most extraordinary things that I'd ever found. And I think in the end, distilling that has come down to two things. Um, again, because of Africa, with its rivalries and civil wars and ethnic cleansings and ethnic tensions and everything else, I really, really do believe that as human beings, what unites us is bigger than what divides us. Mm. And um, museums are a very good place to explore that kind of stuff. I went on a funny trip to the West Bank, where in Birzeit they are trying to build um, a museum of Palestinian history. They've got no collection, they've got no building, but they have a flagpole, and on the flag it says, museum. <laughs> <laughs> a safe place to explore unsafe ideas. Mm. Well, mm. I think that's what it should be. Mm. And are, are you able to do that through vehicles like The Economist? Uh, can you explore art and take, um, help create that I'm really, place? I'm really, really, really lucky. We're a long way from London, so I can say it to you. It's something I never <laughs> say in London. I have the nicest job in London. I sit at the back of the class, which means that I don't have to talk about hedge funds. Mm. Uh, Mark Carney or the future of the world economy. I can just talk about art and art and nobody really minds too much what I'm doing as long as I'm on the back of the train following the editor. He doesn't mind at all. It is it's the best place. <laughs> <That's a great laughs> <job. laughs> I keep that very quiet. Just so that <laughs> <laughs> Kerry, if I may, uh, your family has led by example for a very long time about philanthropy. But as well, you turn your mind off into the question of how we encourage the next generation mm. to take up philanthropy and to see it as part of contributing in a broader mm. um, part of engagement. How should we do that? And what, are, what, what works in your experience? 
I think um, one of the formative ways in which I, I came to think about this issue was on my very early years on one of my first boards, the Australian Chamber Orchestra. And I saw that that was a group of essentially very young musicians um, under the stewardship of Richard Tognetti, who was only 22 or 23 when he took over as artistic director. But as that group of musicians aged, um, and some of them have been there, like Richard, for now 22 or 23 years. Um, as they aged and matured, um, they recognised, um, and so did the board on, on which I sat, um, that the next generation is the key. They were a young, dynamic orchestra. That's why people went to see them. They stood up when they played their instruments. They didn't sit down like a, like a symphony orchestra. They made world headlines because they stood up wearing Akira Isagawa mm. um, <laughs> in the Wigmore Hall, and they were different. And they, they formed a second-tier orchestra, which was aimed at education. Mm. And, and that re reinvigorated the orchestra themselves. It connected them with community. Um, they, they formed a, this second tier orchestra. They gave young musicians straight out of places like the National Academy of Music, yep. which we nearly lost and, and, and we didn't uh, from our cultural landscape, thank goodness. Um, uh, so they gave employment to those people and, and, and that orchestra goes into schools and that program has been enormously successful. But don't be, don't, don't be fooled, it's not just graduates from ANAM that go into those schools, it's Richard Tognetti and Helena Rathbone and a number of those original mm. members regularly go in with them and they're very committed to that education program. One of the things I'm most proud of um, with my board work over the last 15 years is the legacy I was able to leave behind at Heidi Museum of Modern Art, mm -hmm. which was the Sydney Meyer Education mm -hmm. Centre. It has to be said, I, I wasn't born into the Meyer family. I was privileged to um, marry its best looking grandson. <laughs> <laughs> Um, originally sorry, Rupert. <laughs> um, um, so, but, but um, uh, I mean, we, I operate in, in a kind of um, space that maybe I was always supposed to operate in, which was, uh, you know, surrounded by people who love to do what I've always loved to do. So um, I see education as absolutely part of it. And the wonderful thing about Heidi is that we were getting school kids in the thousands out there anyway, but we were managing them so badly. They had nowhere to put their bags. They had nowhere to sit and write. Um, they, they had no dedicated space where they weren't going to annoy people in the main gallery, which is what children do in galleries. They do annoy people. Um, so we set up a, a separate centre and um, it's used for many other things as well but it is primary focus is to house school children with little taps and little loos and mm. places to write um, and places to put their little backpacks so they don't knock over sculptures in the gallery. So it all works and, and you know of course Tony Elwood did this so well um, at Queensland Art Gallery and he's now doing it at the NGV but you know it was nice to think that um, the Sydney Meyer Fund gave money to do it uh, well over a decade ago at Heidi. So. Thank you Kerry. Claire can I turn to you there was a fascinating uh, discussion toward the end of Jean's presentation about China and what's happening there and your deep engagement with museums and architecture in China. I doubt the world has ever seen an explosion of museum building and gallery building as it's currently seeing in China. How do you make sense of this in terms of from local traditions as opposed to drawing in an institutional form that comes from somewhere else? And how much do the institutions you see reflect, in a sense, Chinese cultural aspirations rather than a, a marker of what a museum might be? Um, well, I think essentially, historically, there is no Chinese model for the museum, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, art would be displayed in a private drawing room a scroll taken out of a drawer and spread for a very limited audience. The first museum in China is the Sikawe Museum in Shanghai from 1868. Very late museum. It was a uh, 
French Jesuit who opened the museum. So I think uh, China ultimately uh, in opening museums is um, accepting in a way a Chinese form. That mm -hmm. said, uh, having this museum building boom, as you mentioned, yeah. unlike any other, um, establishes a Chinese type. Um, as things progress in curation, direction, programming, those can no doubt be influenced by the uh, inherent Chinese culture, which has such a great written, uh, richness in the arts, if not in museums itself. So I think as it evolves, and it will be a slower progression than the architectural progression, I imagine. <laughs> um, but I'm excited to see what form it takes. There are currently um, some Western curators involved in uh, some of the better known and uh, respected uh, museums in China, but uh, again, as education changes, I, I expect that will change. Okay. Given that uh, it's not a local tradition but an important one, what a judgment, aesthetic and otherwise, do you apply when evaluating a Chinese cultural institution that, that uses the Western form? And, and, and how do you tell good from bad? How do you just, right. What advice would you give, given that cultural transformation that's going on? Right. Well, for better and for worse, I am a Westerner. <laughs> and so I view the Western Museum through Western eyes, right? Yeah. I view the architecture, frankly, through Western eyes. I didn't show you any of the museums, the archaeological museums shaped like dinosaurs. Now, the local, <laughs> you know, the local Chinese population might be very fond of those. I personally am not attracted to those. <laughs> uh, and I think similarly, what I'm looking for in museums is the same kind of opportunities that Western museums propose, which is why I showed that kind of nutty mall museum, because the programming there, the exhibitions there, a lot of the things going on there are what I love about museums. Um, now, what the local population loves might be very different. The lines outside this uh, current Mocha yeah. show are 20-somethings, and I have to say the, the local experience of that collection is very much about photography and having your photo taken in front of the art. That's, uh, not that that isn't also happening in Western museums, but that's a very specific local appreciation of, of that exhibition. Um, but yeah, again, for me, I can only use my own yeah. warped Western standards <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to evaluate what's going on. Makes sense, thank you. Jean, can I stay in this theme for a minute about our region and your expertise there? And coming from a, you started with a basis where, given your French language skills, you're interrogating a culture you know well, to move on to involvement in Asian art, uh, you had to build expertise rather than sort of work from, from a, set, a set of norms. How successful do you think Australian institutions have been in doing so? You mentioned, of course, the Asia Pacific Triennial, but other institutions, and, and how far have we got to go in doing this? Well, <coughs> I wish that I had a perhaps more positive story to share, and whatever I say is my own personal opinion, just uh, from observation. On the good side, on the positive side, as I've travelled through Asia, I've been to Japan 46 times, for example, and I've counted it in my passport, uh, far <laughs> less often uh, to China, but I've just come from Indonesia and I've been, you know, Vietnam and Cambodia because it's a pan, my personal collection is pan-Asian, our personal collection, Australia and Asia, and of course the work that's been done at the gallery has been the same. The, on the positive side, uh, there are Australians wherever I go who speak the language. So we must be doing something right, particularly in Japan, uh, but uh, in China too. You do find young Australians um, who are not only working in embassies, but are working in restaurants and, you know, just doing sort of regular jobs. 
uh, even some, and I'm thinking of one particular instance, a young Australian a friend of our families who is doing a double degree in medicine, Chinese medicine and Western medicine, so it will take him nine or ten years. He's almost done, and he uh, had to learn Chinese in order to do it. Mm. So, you know, th that's the good news story. On the um, not-such-good-news uh, side, I think that the trouble from my perspective with the universities and the art galleries and all the institutions who could be and do to some extent promote brilliantly the work in the re region uh, that needs desperately to be done, it's often a stop-start thing. Somebody starts it who has a passion for it, it can be a government minister or a prime minister or a vice chancellor or, you know, whoever it is, and it gathers the most fabulous momentum. And uh, just as everybody thinks we're over the uh, sort of, you know, not over the finish line, because there is no going over yeah. the finish line, but you're over the main bump and we won't go back. It just evaporates, and then five years later or longer, a new person comes along and starts saying things that were done the five years before. <laughs> the continuity doesn't seem to be managed as well as uh, the enthusiasm. You know, the enthusiasm is kindled, and then the continuity doesn't seem to be well managed. That's just from my perspective. There. How, how do we overcome that? How do we make a difference there? I think, you know, memories are very short. I grew up in apartheid South Africa, as, as you know from uh, the dates, if you did your calculations properly, the dates I gave. And there's a whole generation of South Africans, black South Africans, African South Africans, who never lived under apartheid. Now, somehow, it's got to be maintained, the, the, the memory the of memory, it. Yeah. And I think it's about maintenance of memory. Of course, archives, Thomas, are a key to that. But the general population is not going to sit at the Getty looking at these wonderful archives. Uh, the internet's a great help. And it is, a, you know, there are people here from, and the uh, uh, group has dwindled, but there are people here from uh, regional galleries all over Australia. They take the message back. You know, you, the more you talk, the more the conversation in, in a way gathers momentum. I don't know. You're a better place to know how you keep the thing going than I am. <laughs> what you need is a really good institute of art history, and we, can, we may be able to solve that one. Thank you. Can I, can I turn to Angus Trumbull? Uh, who's not a speaker in today's symposium, but has been here and just stepped into a really important role with the National Portrait Gallery. And um, obviously we're delighted, not only that you've come back from the US to do this, but as an alumnus of this university, particularly delighted. In the US, you encountered the difference between the Australian and American experience of philanthropy. And uh, we can all tell stories about how different it is, but in a sense, what are you bringing back with you? What did you learn that will help you uh, in the National Portrait Gallery? Uh, well, Vice Chancellor, thank you very much indeed, um, and and indeed thank you to my deputy chair, Jean Sherman, for being on the search committee. <laughs> <laughs> we begged him to come. <laughs> um, it, it's it's something I've been thinking about all day. Yeah. Um, perhaps if I can frame it this way, um, the, the institution from which I come uh, is. Uh, a miniature, like a miniature version of the Getty Research Institute in the sense that uh, it is both uh, a museum and research institute devoted to the history of British art. And by Britain, British, we mean Britain in the world. Mm -hmm. Our purview was uh, every aspect of the imperial project that produced not necessarily destructive uh, vibrations in every part of the, of the globe where Britain operated. The collections of rare books, manuscripts, archives, and works of art, the building in which they're housed, and the 350 odd million dollar endowment were all given to the uh, uh, university by one person, the late Paul Mellon. And that's a very unusual uh, situation um, in that it produces for the university a dilemma. Um, the uh, executors of the estate of Paul Mellon uh, would like the institution to remain essentially a monument mm. to Mr. Mellon. Mm. And that 
is inhibiting from the point of view of conventional philanthropic activity that routinely takes place elsewhere in, in the United States. We're moreover um, somewhat limited in our capacity um, to further build the endowment by our close association, our obligation to work closely with the development office of Yale University because they don't want me, uh, an ambitious and greedy curator, to be knocking at the door of a Yale benefactor in search of $100,000 to support such and such an acquisition if a week later they were proposing to present uh, a request for a $100 million gift to uh, endow the School of Music or, or, or the School of Management. So that put us in the position of, of having to develop support in other areas, specifically uh, collectors of British art who had no previous association whatsoever with Yale <laughs> University. And all of these things made us somewhat unusual. By contrast, um, and what I think for me is so refreshing about coming back, um, the institution into which I move uh, is almost um, a, a, a from central casting demonstration of, of what Rupert was describing this morning. Uh, the National Portrait Gallery of Australia could not exist, would not have existed without uh, the passionate support of our founding benefactors, Gordon and Marilyn Darling and others, um, nor would it exist, uh, have existed uh, and could continue to exist without the committed support of governments of both complexions. Um, uh, and this process has culminated lately with the um, establishment of, of the gallery as a statutory authority on, on an equal footing with other collecting agencies. It's an act of parliament that was supported by both sides of the federal parliament. It's uh, our act, uh, it's my act and your act. Uh, it is something that um, is a, a, a deed um, of public significance and a sign, I think, of the commitment of governments, um, successive governments, to the health of the institution. That's not to say that the future of the institution um, will, uh, can uh, rely on uh, growth of that support. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's likely to remain flat uh, and perhaps diminish as a proportion of our income but it's certain that we couldn't survive without it. Uh, and so our task is to build um, the philanthropic side. Okay. Another, just with one further point, um, which I think um, uh, struck me particularly during Jean's presentation. In America, if you're embedded in a, an art museum as a, as a curator, say, of Renaissance bronzes or medieval tapestries, or uh, Greek and Roman antiquities, it is possible for you to pursue a career lasting 35 to 40 years in a public art museum and never once cross paths with an artist, a practicing <laughs> artist. You might choose to do so. Indeed, you might uh, make sure that you do so, but it's quite possible for you never to meet uh, a practicing artist. By contrast, no matter what you do in an Australian public art museum, it is impossible for you not to be intimately associated with practicing artists day after day. And that is the great joy of this profession in this country. Um, it, is, it is simply embedded in, on our boards of, of, of directors and trustees, um, on our staffs, and in our programs. And that, I think, is a tremendously important point of strength for our, not just our national, but our regional, local, and um, state institutions. Can I, a supplementary, if I may, and the question I, you get sick of answering, if you haven't already. A portrait gallery presents a particular problem between the choice of pieces that are the famous and the, the good and the great, and wanting to promote great art, which isn't necessarily about the most significant of subject matters. How do you, from an artistic point of view, balance that, that set of tensions? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, and, and the problem is further exacerbated by the fact that we're a fledgling institution, yeah. barely 20 years old, sure. and um, you know the great colonial and early colonial portraits are in captivity. 
Yeah. We have marvellous and supportive loan arrangements with our, with our elder sister colleagues uh, at the state and federal level. Huge support from other institutions for lending works and, and the state libraries where many portraits um, go to die. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. Um, uh, and I, the, my answer to that is you're quite right. Our, our public um, is uh, as interested oftentimes uh, in uh, the stories um, told by the sitters as much as the stories interpreted by artists. One of the ways that we can um, stimulate that uh, unique um, confrontation uh, is, is to bring artists and sitters together in a thoughtful and hopefully nuanced way so that the portrait ends up being better than it otherwise would be if, um, if there were a, um, an unfortunate mismatch between sitter and artist. There are no guarantees, but, um, but, but our curatorial staff are accustomed to uh, making those, those uh, recommendations, and we'd, we have a busy program of commissions, and that's a very exciting aspect of our work. Um, uh, embedded in your question is, this, is, is, the, is the unspoken uh, thing, how do you cope with a lousy picture that, of a famous person? <laughs> That's right. um, uh, my, dear, my, dear, my dear friend Patrick McCackie gave me one piece of advice when, when I left New Haven, and that was never have a first class, class, first class row over a second class work of art. And I have every intention of following that advice. <laughs> Lovely business. Mm -hmm. So we launched uh, last year the campaign for the University of Melbourne as uh, part of our philanthropic efforts, and we launched the Canberra version of that in, in the portrait gallery. So all of our graduates from Canberra came in, and the gallery kindly organised so that many portraits of significant University of Melbourne people in the collection would be on display. It was a remarkably generous and thoughtful way of receiving this group, and then we did the same at the MCA. Mm -hmm and had a very similar experience. And uh, the willingness of institutions mm. to reach out and support other institutions, I thought, was, was really great. remarkable and great. It's delighted. So I hope the role is hugely enjoyable. Thank you very much. Janie, a question for you, uh, and the last of my questions. You've, you've committed to a change, having devoted your professional career to a really intense study of fine art and to, and to teaching generations of students, and there are many in the room who benefited from your classes and your scholarship. And you've decided to take on full-time the directorship of the Institute. What is it that you'd like to achieve in this role? And, and what do you see the role of scholarship in the world of arts and philanthropy as we've discussed it? Well, there are some big questions. Um, the reason for the change is I think that you can't do too many things well. <laughs> and um, probably to concentrate on just creating this Institute of Art History is what I'd like to focus on. You know the background to it very well, that it developed from the CIHA Congress. Mm -hmm. We now have a rather wonderful board. Um, some of the board members are at this table, um, Kerry and Jean and others have helped us to achieve this conference. And I feel that there's a real mood to achieve something and do it uh, differently. Teaching is an ongoing commitment, and we are very privileged, I think, to work in the university uh, and to, to actually help and inspire young people. But that will still go on, I think, at the institute level. And I think there's a real problem. Um, we produce loads of good PhDs. I think we have about 70 people doing PhDs in art history at the University of Melbourne at the moment, and many people working in arts curatorship. But um, postdoctoral uh, scholarships don't exist very often. So there's a whole culture that you could create which would study collections within this university throughout Australia. Um, and there are also wonderful research institutes abroad that we could liaise with. We had an extraordinary talk from Thomas Gertens today, mm -hmm. which um, sort of blew you away with the potential of wonderful resources at the Getty Institute, which was funded not so long ago, really, but has um, amazing resources. And um, he gave a transformational account of how 
he turned an institution that just looked at Europe into one that was meaningful from its uh, position on the Pacific Basin. Um, there are other institutes of art history right throughout the world, and we thought of creating an Asian Pacific, uh, South African, a uh, South um, an African, uh, South American one. And from the position of being president of international art history for four years, there's enormous enthusiasm to do a different kind of art history or art histories south of the equator or in Asia. And I suppose um, we've heard Fiametta speak about being born in Kenya. If you're born in a different part of the world, you think differently about things, you create things differently. And although you might leave undergraduate teaching uh, behind, uh, I think you never really lose the, 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 the wish to sort of help young people and you know, encourage them to do things. Mm, that's wonderful. Mm. Thank you. Colleagues, we have about 10 minutes to run, and you have in front of you a remarkable panel of experts. So I'm going to invite any questions from the floor, and if I seem to be irritatingly repeating them, it's only so that people on the video stream can, who may not be able to hear you from the floor, will hear the question. So can I invite questions, and could you indicate who you'd like to answer them? Please. Thank you for the conference and the debate. Uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. I, I have to say that studying art history here has been the most enriching experience for me, um, the most challenging and enriching. And all I'm going to say is that I hope philanthropists will continue to invest in art history, art historians, and the Art History Institute. And I hope that in this country, art history continues to be important in curricula at secondary levels. Um, and so that there is a possibility of filling up the museums of the world with curators who have an art history background and project management. I mean, project management is important. It's important to be able to manage budgets and raise funds. But without art history and content, um, um, I'm sorry to say, um, the museum becomes a shell. Of course, architecture is fabulous and can inspire, inspire us to develop ideas in wonderful spaces, but ultimately who creates art are artists and who interprets art and links with our historical periods and then con convey histories and perspectives are curators and art historians. So, okay. so yeah. with that, I leave you food for right. thought. <laughs> Thank you for the comment. And Mr. May, anybody? May yeah, please, one? jump in. Um, I, I am uh, um, excited and um, astonished um, about the engagement of philanthropy in research in Australia. Um, I um, have a background from Europe and um, some experience in the United States. It's much easier uh, to get um, donors to um, help buying a picture and um, doing acquisitions mm. and have the name on the label. Uh, this kind of uh, philanthropy is the usual one. But um, research cannot um, so easily be seen and cannot so easily be um, uh, yeah, shown as something extremely important. And uh, uh, I, I was really, um, I, I can only admire and congratulate um, Australia. <laughs> let me, um, <laughs> let me um, be pathetic and um, uh, congratulate the spirit here that um, um, these um, engaged people um, want to bring forward a research institute. You know, this is absolutely, absolutely astounding astounding and unique and I think um, it is on a very good um, track and you feel there's a dynamism and an interest to bring things forward and make something special and um, so it's wonderful and we are looking forward to partner with this institute. Thank you, it's a wonderfully generous comment, I appreciate it. I think there's a question over here. There's a microphone just on its way. Thank you. 
I've greatly enjoyed the conversation today, but one area that we haven't really talked about, or you haven't talked about, is community arts. And I know that a lot of philanthropic money in Australia does go to support art on the ground in communities. So art not as practiced by artists, but by ordinary people and children who may or may not become artists in the future. So my question really is to Rupert in particular about could you help us to make that link between what we've been talking about today, but also philanthropy that goes to neighbourhood houses, after school care, um, art therapy for people who are ill or disadvantaged people, people in prisons. I think that there's another side of um, global giving to the arts that we haven't really talked about and I'd appreciate yeah. some conversation it, there. It, it, it's a very good question. I, in, my, um, in some of my comments earlier, I, I did talk about the the broad context, particularly the role of the Australia Council, and in fact the community partnerships program of the Australia Council is, is, a, is a very substantial part of what we do, but it's also imbuing <coughs> in a lot else of what we do, community partnerships uh, aspects, uh, and some of which have been described um, by you. In the, in the philanthropic space, um, the sector is actually a bit clunky about the way in which it goes about um, funding uh, community arts. And I say that in the sense that um, a lot of philanthropic trusts organise themselves in a way where they will fund education or they'll fund health or they'll fund welfare or they'll fund the arts. Um, and often there are different committees that are constructed around the allocation of various parts of budget across those, uh, those headings. And there, there isn't even within the same philanthropic trust the sort of collaborative conversation that might take place across those, um, those program areas. So, so very often um, it works out quite well for the arts in that there could be arts projects that get funded out of four budgets. Um, it's not always bad news, I'd have to say. It's, uh, in my observation, it's been more often uh, good news. Um, but uh, I don't know of a philanthropic trust that uh, is focused exclusively on, uh, on, on those sorts of community projects of, of which you've spoken. Thank you. We will need to come to a close, but I'm going to go around the panel one last time and invite a closing statement. And Jean, if I may start with you, I'd just like to say a sentence or two about what you're taking out from this conference. Would be oh. great. Um, <clears throat> well, I think there, there have been some w wonderful statistics. I don't take in inf information easily through my ear. I don't know why, but I, when I read information, I remember it. Yes. So it's just long habit, I think, of, of reading. And I, not when I read on the screen. I've got to read on paper for some uh, reason to do with habit as well. So uh, what I found uh, during the... Uh, course of the day is I took quite a, lot, a number of notes and that's the way that I can uh, say, say to myself or understand for myself that there's information I want to uh, absorb. I will reread that information. I've got the most peculiar filing system, but it, it does work for me. And I find every staff member who works for me adopts the filing system, <laughs> which they use afterwards. Um, so I, I've taken away well, different things from different people. Claire's book I read in detail and of course I had met a lot of the owners of those museums, those Chinese yeah. museums, when I went to those uh, uh, the forum in Hong Kong over two years. Rupert, lots of statistics which I always appreciate and I'm sorry that it's such a difficult task to um, gather these statistics and I'm hoping that it will be made easier over time through the good work of the Australia Council. Simon's talk, I really knew a lot because Simon and I are in conversation, so I really, uh, for me it was uh, rehearsing in, in a way what, what I knew already, Simon's wonderful work and uh, generosity. I've sent I don't know how many bouquets of flowers, Simon, <laughs> over the years <laughs> to say thank you from all of us. Um, and if you met her, I, it was, uh, I read the article and it, it blew me away. I don't know of any journalist in Australia who has mm. given the scope to write an article as rich and as dense and as well researched as that. That's great, and of course, Angus and I are going to be doing a lot of talking <laughs> <laughs> over the next uh, while. So I think, you know, I, it's not one thing that I've taken away, it's different things from different people, depending on what I've come with, okay. because you come with something. Thank you. And Jean has unexpectedly summed up 
<laughs> one of your presentations, but that can only be a good thing. Well, for me, at least. Perhaps a, a closing sentence, Claire? Uh, I suppose what I'm taking away is even more optimism for developments in China, um, understanding all that's going on here, and hoping that the model of what's going on here can have influence with the neighbor up north. Thank you. I'll leave it. I, I'm reflecting on how we can make the statistics uh, sing. Um, <laughs> I, I tell the story quite often of walking back from the portrait gallery to the National Gallery during the time that the Fred Williams exhibition was on, and there was a woman who came out of the gallery who uh, had to speak to someone, uh, and she chose me. Um, <laughs> and for 20 minutes, she told me what it had meant to her in her life having seen that exhibition. A you know, very moving description for her. We count her as one. Yeah. Um, that, that's the only way she gets counted in the sector, yeah. and it's, uh, it's just not good enough. Thank you, Rupert. Beautifully put. Thomas. Well, this is my uh, second visit um, in Australia, and the first time I was here, I participated in uh, Chinese Congress, so I was very busy running around from one uh, lecture to the other. And I didn't um, get so much about Australia, but this time I take away more knowledge about Australia and um, uh, more knowledge about this dynamism and um, this responsibility of private and um, public partnership, which seems to be very um, lively in this country and very important and to carry on this responsibility that um, these two parts should work together. And um, I think this is um, uh, a very wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you. Simon. I, um, I've had an extraordinary day. Um, I've enjoyed the conversation. And I really want to thank um, Jenny and Kerry and also the university for um, facilitating the conversation and look forward to continuing it. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. Kerry. I want to thank um, all of our panel uh, who've just been wonderful. Each speaker has brought something really significant and at the highest levels of their field. But I want to take up on Thomas's point that there's a dynamism and a spirit. There is a dynamism and a spirit and we're well supported um, by being housed at the university and our seed funding has come from the university. But our next step is to mature into a well-funded and secu financially secure organisation. And for that, we need money. <laughs> you need your own gaffy. <laughs> Thank you. Angus. I, <clears throat> just before I came this morning, I went for a long walk around the campus, reflecting on the fact that it's 32 years since I arrived here as, a, as an undergraduate, not yet 17. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't tell you how it's, it's not just wonderful to be back in Australia, but particularly wonderful to be back on this campus, my alma mater. Mm -hmm. And it was very moving. It's such a beautiful February morning. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. See you later. I um, gave in this special report on the future of museums to The Economist on the 20th of November. I'm afraid deadlines are something etched in your brain. So ever since it came out, I have been looking for what I'm going to do next. It took me four years to find this one, but I think today I have found my new project, which is that there are many, 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 many people in the world who are becoming richer and richer. And I think my next special report is going to be about global philanthropy. And entirely appropriately, the last word belongs to Janie. Well, <laughs> I think Fiametta made the most wonderful point about why we have an Australian Institute of Art History. We're looking at subjects that are different, and we have made something of a study of philanthropy. We have a major book coming out about the Grimwade Befaction to the University of Melbourne with Magunya in September 2014. We have a review. Oh wow! <laughs> well, it's 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 a very good story because the Magunya benefaction is an extraordinary. I mean, it's an extraordinary benefaction in very different ways. I won't go into it now, but um, it is it is a very wonderful story about philanthropy. 
And we also have Gerard Vaughan, who is the uh, Director Emeritus of the National Gallery of Victoria, who is in Oxford at the moment because his son is doing extraordinary things, so we've forgiven him for not being here. But he's writing an important book on philanthropy in terms of Australian collectors. And there will be in this book people who are named throughout the world, like Rupert Murdoch, who is an extraordinary collector, Barry Humphreys, and goodness knows who else, and Simon Morton, perhaps, and Jean. I think many people around the table have been interviewed for it. And so we look forward very much to this publication indeed. So philanthropy is something we've studied because I think of the dynamism of the board and making us sort of think about why do things. And when I did the CIHA Congress, I was very naive about philanthropy, but we did have very good people on the board, a small board. I'm looking at Rupert as I'm speaking. And um, I learned a hell of a lot quite quickly. And I also learned that Melbourne philanthropists really want to be involved. They're creative, they're cultivated, and um, they're fun to be with and to work with. And so we, 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 you know, I think that was one thing that led to the idea to have an institute from it. And I thank the Vice Chancellor for helping us at every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you. Can I invite you to thank this wonderful panel for an <laughs>